For nearly 80 years, a huge portion of coastal South Africa was closed off to the public. With many of its pits now deemed overmined and abandoned, American journalist Matthew Gavin Frank set out across the infamous Diamond Coast to investigate an illicit trade that supplies a global market. Immediately, he became intrigued by the ingenious methods used in facilitating smuggling, particularly the illegal act of sneaking carrier pigeons onto mine property, affixing diamonds to their feet and sending them into the air. Blending elements of reportage, memoir, and incantation, Flight of the Diamond Smugglers is a rare and remarkable portrait of exploitation and greed in one of the most dangerous areas of coastal South Africa. With his powerful prose and insatiable curiosity, Matthew Gavin Frank reminds us that the world is a place of wonder if only we look. Matthew is the author of The Mad Feast and Preparing the Ghost, a New York Times editor's choice, an NPR notable book, and New Yorker book to watch out for. His work appears widely in journals and anthologies, including the Kenyan Review, Guernica, and the Best American Essays. He teaches creative writing in the MFA program at Northern Michigan University and lives in Marquette, Michigan. Matthew, it's a thrill for me to welcome you tonight and for Gramercy Books to share your book with our community. It's such a pleasure to be here, Linda. Thank you so much. And speaking of the world being a place of wonder, Matthew will be in conversation with Amy Nezukumatato. Amy is the author of World of Wonders in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments. This collection of essays was named Barnes and Noble 2020 Book of the Year and a finalist for the Kirkus Prize. Amy has published four award-winning poetry collections and has received fellowships from the NEA and the Guggenheim Foundation. She teaches in the University of Mississippi's MFA program. Amy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Linda. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Amy. Thanks to all of you in our audience for joining us this evening. Now, a warm welcome to Matthew Gavin Frank in conversation with Amy Nezukuma Tatel. And the floor is yours. Woo. Yay. <laughs> I always feel like I should have like one of those recorders that gives the applause, the applause, the applause. Matthew, I'm so excited to be chatting with you on this book. Um, you know, I think I've, I've been um, diving into and out of this book since the summer. So this book is actually, I think of this very fondly when I first saw the manuscript as one of the things that helped get me through the summer, you know, and this was such a bizarro, weird summer. And so um, I'm so glad that that I'm able, I'm sad that we're not able to see each other in person, but I'm so glad that um, to help you, you know, as I, as I said, I wanted to shout about this book the minute I finished reading this um, in manuscript. So um, I wanna do, uh, we have a couple of fun things in, um, planned for the audience a little bit later, but um, I wanted to just kind of dive right in. Um, and, you know, there are so many questions I have. I'm type A, you know, Capricorn. So I have, I had these all like planned and listed to go, but I, I really, I really want to make this a, like, just like a chat among friends, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and what I wanted to see, it's kind of a nerdy question. It's somewhat selfish because I just love hearing this answer from, from essayists is, um, is this one. So it's a little more of a crafty kind of question and then we'll dig in. Um, you know, I start my poems usually with an image, you know, and I start my essays with a question that's kind of nagging at me. Do you feel this way too? Like, I'm curious about like how SAS start um, their, their writing, you know, their writing for the day, or if you, once you know you're writing towards a project, that kind of thing. But mainly I'm just curious, like, do you start with a question too? And if so, um, what was the kind of the pushing pulsating question for this book? Um, and if you don't really start with a question, if you wouldn't characterize your writing that way, how would you, how do you start? How do you start a, a book like this? Yeah, um, it, it, it felt very, <clears throat> um, 
accidental. It was rooted in circumstance, but like between image and question, strangely, I think it probably began more with an image. Uh, um, and, and then the image just kind of um, had this magnetic pull probably on a series of questions that just attached themselves to it. And um, I, I, was, I was in South Africa uh, in the Diamond Coast and uh, I was in a bar called Diamond Hunters um, in Port Nalith, South Africa. Mm. And I, I was having a Richelieu brandy and there was a guy sitting next to me who recognized that I wasn't from town. Mm. Um, I mean, when, when a, you know, an area is closed off for the better part of 80 years, as Linda yeah. mentioned, outsiders vividly stand out I mean sure. um, and so uh he immediately began um asking me questions and then immediately began um telling me these stories about his work as a diamond diver oh my gosh and was this unbidden or come on you could tell me were you like hmm he seems like pretty interesting or did he just start telling you about his job no, he, he seemed very interesting, but I had no, I had no idea. Like this book wasn't even a glimmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it became a glimmer as <laughs> you know we, we got into the the bottle of brandy, I guess. Um, and so he, it was fairly unbidden, which is kind of strange because mm. I feel as if um, folks would have been reluctant to speak to me. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, folks were in, in uh, I mean, this is like transgenerational isolation um, in this closed off company town, um, but it was the exact opposite for the most part. Um, folks seemed almost over eager um, to the point of giddiness to, to talk to somebody who wasn't from this place mm -hmm. and wasn't, um, you know, from this particular company controlled milieu and yeah. so uh folks started unburdening um things to me very very quickly and sharing like otherwise you know intimate things and he told me this story he was the first guy this diamond diver to tell me the story about how pigeons um were used to spirit diamonds out of out of the mines um Gosh. when I first saw that I just was like I mean you told me a little bit I think you told me it's about a pigeon <laughs> and that, that's, I don't think you mentioned the diamonds, the mines. So I was like, okay, great. I love reading about birds. And then when I read that, I mean, I just had to, I, I just had to put the manuscript down and just stare out of my window for a minute. I had no idea that that is how um, diamonds were kind of extracted in this kind of, in the secret way. And yeah, anyway, I, I just wanted to nerd out a little bit because that was a moment I almost wish it didn't I, it's an incredible title and stuff and but I almost wish it didn't have like the diamond smugglers on somehow on the title on the book because I wish I could recreate that moment of surprise and absolute just um just wanting to sit and ponder that situation just trying to picture that like make a movie in my mind um of the of that moment of like and you know um tucking having a little boy tuck in a, a well I don't want to give too much away I don't know if I should but um suffice it to say when I was reading about that whole moment I I just had no idea and um basically the rest of my afternoon was done <laughs> I, I I had to get to the end of this manuscript um, yeah. um I I I I just I I just couldn't get over it I I yeah. um the, the image of a pigeon with, uh, you know, overloaded with diamonds. This was like the first image, like pigeons overloaded with diamonds who lost their natural GPS, which is what yeah. happens to a pigeon if there's too much yeah. weight yeah. Right, if too much to carry. And they started landing at random along the coastal beaches there. Oh and my so gosh. I just with, that image, with that rain of pigeons from the sky. And um, it's funny that you mentioned the title. So like um, there were like two other titles that were in the works. Like the, the first one was just um, called A Brief Atmospheric Future, um, which was this weird metaphorical thing that had to do yeah. with like grief loss, but also the way um, a pigeon's head um, you know, uh, kind of like bobs ahead of its body and the rest of its body catches uh, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And then the, the other title was The Overburden, uh, which is the name in the mining trade for all of like, uh, they call the waste rock, the spoil uh. that they have to get out of the way and excavate in order to get to the diamonds. Mm -hmm. So basically the land that we walk on, the earth that we walk on, the mine, the folks uh, in the yeah. mine, call that the overburden. Um, but, mm -hmm. then, uh, but, but then the press was like, um, we need something a little juicier, something that pops. And, and so, like, Flight of the Diamond Smugglers came out, you know, just kind of came out in a. It's a great. Chart. It seemed like some old paperback that you would find. You know? <laughs> no, no, I, di I didn't mean that as any sort of like making fun of the title. I, I mm -hmm. Trust me, you're going to get people just pulling this off based on the title alone, pulling this off the shelves based on the title, title alone. Um, I just know for that moment when you when you when you first sent me in an email, like I'm writing about pigeons. I was like, oh, great, sweet, cute. You know, um, I thought it would be kind of a natural history. And then, yeah, that image of basically, you know, like of, of pigeons wearing like these bags of diamonds and flying out of the cave. Oh, yeah, you, folks who don't have this book, you, if that image alone um, would sell me on this book, it's that that's worth the price of, of, of this whole book um, and then some. So, um, you know, that takes me a little bit, I don't know if uh, maybe just to continue on that just a little, little bit, um, Matthew, like, I wonder then, can you take us, the, the audience, and again, I, I'm cautious because I don't know how much you want um, the audience to know or yet, yeah, but we soon come in your book to meeting a young, um, a young boy named Bartholomew, or I'm sorry, um, 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 not Bartholomew, Bartholomew is the pigeon that I can't get out of my mind. Um, the young boy's name is Mzizi. And um, can you, recreate or can you give a little bit of um introduction in terms of like how how you met him first of all how you were introduced and then um if you can share maybe like did did he know that you were like kind of wanting to know his story um because you 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 had then decided to write a book was this all just kind of you just wanted to kind of see what what he had to say. I mean, can you talk about your interactions with Mzizi as well? Because he's also, I think he has appeared in my dreams and I've never seen, I've never seen a picture of him, um, but it's a very haunting um, character, person that we, that we come to encounter. One of the most unforgettable, um, I say character, but one of the most unforgettable um, people that I, I again, I, I picture meeting him in this summer of a pandemic, you know, so uh, to me, he, he kept me company and your voice kept me company. But yeah, let's talk about MZZ a little bit. How, can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, at this point, by the time I, I met him, uh, I was thinking I might like write an essay uh, mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, ab about these towns, um, about and, the a bit. And for the people who don't know, who is, can you talk about who is MZZ um, as well? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So he um, he's a diamond miner. He he um, labors in the diamond pits uh, for De Beers, um, and he is thirteen. Uh, De Beers um, claims that um, they don't violate any child labor laws, and in my research. Um, uh, I, I could not uncover any evidence that shows that like the De Beers Corporation proper in their air conditioned mm -hmm. London offices like knew what was going on mm -hmm. on the coast of South Africa, but um, uh, I, I, I have to imagine they do and um, whether they officially sanction these sorts of practices or not, um, they happen. Um, what happens along the Diamond Coast in these closed towns has oftentimes very little to do with edicts that are handed down by the company that their stakeholders get to, you know, check out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I have no doubt that they're aware of that. So uh, I, I met him um, in, a, he was shopping with his mom in a little convenience store and um we were buying the same things um there was, <laughs> it was very little but we were i mean this we were both buying um 
sheep's neck in cellophane, mm. um, like a, just a good stew meat, and um, an iceberg lettuce. Mm. And so uh, we we struck up a conversation when we were getting our groceries checked out. And how old was he at the time when you first met him? Oh, 13. 13. Oh, 13. Okay, okay. Yeah, this, mm. and this is 2016. Mm, okay. um, and so uh, I, his, his mom was asking what I was doing there, and I, I was telling her. Mm. And, and then she, she told him, Cezy, she basically was like, you should talk to him, talk to him. Like, um, yeah. it's, I mean, tell, tell your story. And yeah. Um, I met him uh, on a beach um, close to where uh, he was living, and he trained pigeons, uh, which is actually like a very dangerous thing to do there. Um, yeah. Since, um, you know, if, if he's caught, uh, you know, not only will his pigeons be executed, but um, there are various yeah. levels of punishment that can be um, levied onto folks who keep pigeons in that area because they're seen as agents of the smuggling. Mm. So, um, for instance, Amy, there was, there was one um, lawmaker in Alexander Bay, South Africa, who made it illegal um, to not shoot a pigeon on sight should one have the means to do so. Oh so gosh. if you were sitting there with a gun and a pigeon crossed your path and you did not kill it, and De Beers Mine Security saw that, um, you could be arrested, you could be evicted from the town, you could be beaten, or worse. Um, and so, but MCZ brought Bartholomew, his favorite pigeon, uh, to meet me. And we just got into this, this conversation that um, I, I think for me just kind of uh, allowed, allowed this in, in, in a weird way to, to become the book. Um, yeah. He was generous enough to share his story with me and so um hmm. I, 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 and I wanted to share it with others <laughs> yeah yeah it's so I mean like I, I kind of use I kind of viewed that kind of um that interaction as kind of like this guide walking us through the book you know um thankful that MZZ was able to guide you and by, by guiding you, guiding me through this really harrowing, I mean, it's not lost on me. I have a 13 year old. It is not at all lost on me. This book made me so supremely uncomfortable in, um, in the best of ways, meaning um, I can't even, I mean, it, it has changed. Talk about like a book that has changed my view on gems, on mining. Um, and I'm a girly girl. I like a little sparkle, you know, that kind of thing. And I can't, you know, seeing these De Beers commercials and stuff like that, I have this book to make, you know, to make me think of, of uh, the sparkle and on what cost that sparkle is given. And I knew, I've heard of stuff before, but this book really kind of, really brings it to light in a way that I, I think, um, is needed and is um, it's unforgettable. Unforgettable is the word that I keep coming back to. Um, can you talk about a little bit about? I'm, I'm pivot. There's no. Um, I, I have so many questions that I want to ask you. Some of which are just kind of like just asking a friend. You know what? Can you talk a little bit about the, you know the opening part? First of all, I was in tears. Um, There's a very personal revelation that you mentioned with you and your wife um experiencing you know the devastation and the loss of miscarriages and um I wondered can you talk a little bit about that as much as, or as as little or as much as you want to because I've got five million other questions as well but I did want to kind of ask a little bit in terms of how you navigate bringing in grief and trauma to reportage and kind of not saying that you you pivot like oh one is filled with emotion and the other is not because you could tell I could tell that the same heart and the spirit and the tenderness that you write about um, miscarriages is the same heart and spirit and tenderness that you wrote about MZZ and Bartholomew and and things like that so when I say pivot I only mean just in subject not in um, not not in um, coldness or or emotional register you know that kind of thing can you talk about 
I don't know, like, I don't I guess I don't even know if it's a question, but I, I just thought it was so masterful. I, it was like a masterclass on bringing the personal to uh, and tying it in with um, kind of a global, um, a global trauma, taking the personal trauma and kind of tying it into uh, a, a global trauma. Can you talk about that? Like how, how did, I'm curious about if you're at liberty to, to share with us, like how Louisa felt, if she was like, huh, no, this is, this is too much, you know, that kind of thing. Does she read your dress? I'm curious about that kind of relationship as well. Um, having a, a, a spouse who is a writer um, and who sometimes has had to tell me to pull back just a little bit, you know, and, and, I, and I do, but I know that not everybody does that as well. So yeah, if you could talk about all of that, it's a big question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, to answer the last part, um, so like, I mean, Louisa is, a, it, it, and it, 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 as am I, like, um, we're, we're very private, usually. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, um, the act of, of writing and, and art making like perforates that, that privacy and that and that and that force field um there was a lot i i took out um mm -hmm. of, of, of the book sure. um out of respect for for that privacy i mean some of the more yeah um but um yeah but but a lot of it you know of course like stayed and um i feel yeah like each each kind of like um thread like the personal and the public um just kind of haunt one another and and i hope complicate um and add nuance to the other, I suppose. Uh, yeah. I, I, as a writer, oftentimes, like um, I, I, I'm always like scratching for meaning in in my own experience, and rather than just like um, uh, turn inward, I, I oftentimes look outward to make sense of that. And, and I see you do that in in World of Wonders too, of course. Um, just I mean, couching you know issues of. Of, of grief and, and, and racism and um, just, uh, uh, um, you know, sociocultural in, in, indictment and in, in, you know, in, in the engagements of the animal kingdom and the overlaps and disconnects between the human and the animal world. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. And I felt like I was um, uh, kind of doing that the same sort of um, jockeying. There's um, the poet Alberto Rios, um has this and i actually have this like on my uh, like wall behind my desk because i love this and and so i'm i'm just going to read a couple of lines from one of his poems because i feel like um it's uh, it, it inspires me in a crafty way i guess and yeah, yeah. i i feel like it, it it has to do with this question and so this this is like a section from his poem some extensions on the sovereignty of science Okay. Um, which was dedicated to his father and it's about in part his endurance of grief mm. in the aftermath of his father's passing mm. um and i was a student of his and i remember he was telling me like as he was drafting uh he he was facing his own personal grief um too head on he had to mm. find another way to do it oh, and, and it was like this section sort of like ars poetica and so he writes when something explodes, for example, nobody is confused about what to do. You look toward it. Loud is a magnet, but the laws of magnetism are more complex. One might just try as well, one might just as well try this. When something explodes, turn exactly opposite from it and see what there is to see. The loud will take care of itself and everyone will be able to say what happened in that direction. But who is looking the other way? Nature, that magician and author of loud sounds, zookeeper and cook, electrician and provocateur. Maybe these events are nature's sleight of hand, and the real thing that's happening is in the other hand, or behind, or above, or below, or inside of us. And so he, he basically talked about having to turn away from the explosion, to yeah. turn his back on that very scrap of subject matter, his own grief mm -hmm. that was so consuming him, um, and to record what was going on in the other direction, to see mm -hmm. how that could kind of like draw a chalk outline in, in essence around, around his grief. And so I feel like in writing the book, I, I had to turn away from my personal grief and yeah. look in the opposite direction, and, and I found 
pigeons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. And what what a discovery. What um what a way. And and yet you're right, you know, and the in the turning away from it, I mean, it's still there. There's still like, you know, um, you can't, I don't know, maybe other people can. I could not forget that kind of really um heartbreaking kind of open so that kind of almost is like mood lighting for the whole rest of the book and yet there's moments of jubilation there's moments of um happiness and Mazizi um you know uh being so enthusiastic talking how proud he is of uh, how well Barth Bartholomew is trained and you know things like that um you know and speaking of Bartholomew I had to, I have to do this um I know you know, um, I didn't prep you on this or anything like that. So if you'd rather not, that's also okay. But um, for uh, the readers out there throughout this book, one of my favorite parts um, of this is something called there's there's little kind of interludes called Bartholomew variations. And I wonder, we don't have enough time to read maybe all of one, but Matthew, could, could we hear just a little bit, any Bartholomew variation there's six of them throughout. Can we just get maybe like a paragraph just so we can get your voice? Um, and if you can set us up, like what is a Bartholomew variation? Again, Bartholomew is the pigeon, but what are, what are you doing here? And maybe just on the craft thing as well. Um, how did you decide? I know you said that you had like, you know, dozens of them. How did you know which ones to keep? How did you know um, how to space them out? It was just, it's, um, it was just such a great, I, I'm always dazzled when I'm reading a book and I see a move or a, you know, a writing choice. And I'm like, ah, oh, what a brilliant, you know, I, I hadn't seen that before, or at least not in this way. And um, where I feel like I'm learning too, like, oh, every time I came across just when I, you know, was getting into the prose, then I get a Bartholomew variation. And I, and I kind of, I love that kind of, um, disjointed always has a neg neg negative connotation, but I loved having kind of almost like a commercial break. Like here's a, here's Bartholomew when we're done. Can you, can you just give us a snippet? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I'll just read a short, like a short paragraph in the, in, in the first one, in the first Bartholomew variation. Great. And so, uh, you know, Mzizi would um, oftentimes sneak uh, Bartholomew onto mine property, which he, he wouldn't do frequently mm. um, because it's, of course, incredibly risky. So um, dangerous, yeah. Oh, every time he did that, I'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, having a conversation with Mzizi in this book. <laughs> anyway. And, so, and he, um, so uh, uh, South Africa actually um, made it a human rights violation to over-radiate somebody. Mm. Um, and so De Beers used to x-ray um, all of the workers um, every day upon entering and leaving the mine. They had to go through these, yeah, x-ray machines mm. and, and other more invasive searches, of course. Which oh my gosh. Um, well, but um, so when South Africa made that a human rights violation, um, they had like placebo, they had machines that conducted placebo x-rays. Mm. So folks would always step into the machine and the machines would light up and were in the same way, whether they were um, conducting an actual x-ray yeah. um, and actually mapping somebody's innards or the innards of their lunchbox um, or being given a placebo. And so folks would just risk it sometimes and um, CZ would sometimes sneak Bartholomew in, um, in his lunchbox. Uh, and so he is going out to Bartholomew's coop early in the morning here, um, let's say it about sunrise, um, pre-shift. Mcizi coughs and swallows and coughs as the sun turns Bartholomew's feathers orange. The bird refuses given the photopic spectral prowess hiccuping in his genes to close his eyes against the brightness. It's like he's trying to hoard the light for those hours spent packed into a metal lunchbox next to a halved peach chutney sandwich and a single serving bag of Simba tomato sauce flavored potato chips. Bartholomew, like most other pigeons, is so adaptable, so good, he knows when to coo and when to be quiet. And so just a little paragraph, but. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. It's just, 
you need to you need to get this book everybody um to to see i mean the six bartholomew variations are all they come up right when you least expect it so don't cheat and look at the table of contents just let let bartholomew's story unfold um in the pages and that that was such a delight for me when i was when i was reading the book um matthew there i would be remiss if i did not mention that we are in a pandemic like we should be in gramercy books we should be um you know being able to you know to chat into the into the night and spill out into the sidewalk you know that kind of thing i'm so sad that we don't get to do that but can you talk about what being indoors has has done for your writing um you know and i always like to keep it real and say like uh, and that doesn't have to have a grand answer. It could be like, you know, Amy, my writing has been decimated or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. I think it'd be helpful to the writers and non-writers out there just to see how our artists and writers coping. What's been, can you give us like one maybe, one maybe surprising joy that you've had in the pandemic, but also I don't want to make it you know, I don't want there, I don't want to bring in levity if it hasn't been, you know, um, I, I also want to know, like, like, kind of once, uh, how are you getting through? Basically, just, I kind of, I want to ask, um, I, I start off, and this should have been maybe my first question, I, I, I always want to ask writers, how are you doing? How are you doing as a human, you know, um, with all of this, you know, are you watching the news? Are you writing every day? Are you just really treading water? You know, um, how's it going, basically? Yeah, I've, I've been struggling to answer that question. Like, I mean, how do, how do we do that in a socially functional way without being totally disingenuous, right? <laughs> so, yeah, no, I want you to be real. I can tell it a mile away. I, you know, I ask this of my students. I ask this of my, my friends. I have like kind of weekly or monthly check-ins with my friends. I can tell a mile away. So I want you to be real with me, with Gramercy, with everybody here. Like, how, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I've, I think I've been erratic, um, you know, as, as most of us have been, I suppose. I um, feel like my nerve endings have, you know, are constantly exposed, which uh, makes it easy to start writing, um, but um, hard, harder for me to write long, yeah. um, harder for me to like sit there and really burrow into something for hours um, because I feel a little bit more exposed and oversensitive. It's like, um, I don't know, it's like I'm, I'm like an overstimulated cat maybe. <laughs> so, uh, I, I feel like um, as far as the way it's affecting my writing, um, uh, I've, I've been I've been writing um, every day, but I haven't been spending the hours uh, that I used to spend doing yeah. it. And so, if I get a good page, um, I'm I'm like, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna go now pet the cat. Um, the actual <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and like um, and and we've also developed this like really intense codependent relationship with the cat and I during the <laughs> pandemic. Which, which I consider a joy. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so yeah, so um, like the like bookmaking and things might be slower going for me. Um, but but I'm I'm okay with that, and I I was nervous about that and anxious about that initially, but I've just kind of, I guess, sunk in. Um, I I also I'm, I'm lucky, I guess, enough to live in a a place um, that's just, I live in the middle of the woods um, mm. in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Um, Lake Superior is here. And I mean, it's just kind of like the appendix of the US. It's like this <laughs> little, almost like decent looking like growth hanging off of the rest of the continental US. And it's beautiful. Um, it's so beautiful, yeah, yeah. And so it's easy to just, um, be alone in the woods um, mm -hmm. and I go for a lot of wintertime walks and there are still squirrels and there are still <laughs> birds um, that are really hardy and uh, you know they're okay with the cold and and I and I look at them that's that's been a balm for me and I feel like if I was in front of the computer for six hours a day um, as I you know had been in the past these were some of the things that that I, I might miss. And I'm sure they're gonna somehow, however associatively, you know, shape shape the work as as time marches on. Yeah. How, how, yeah. how, how have how have you been? Oh, you know, 
<laughs> that's that's a giant long quite you know um answer but in an, in a nutshell and i want this to be the matthew gavin frank show um you know the easy answer that i that i say um and i do mean this is that there are good days and there are bad days today um was a great day you know um a couple weeks ago we had here i'm here in mississippi um we had this kind of bonkers ice storm um and snow and you know coming from a place i know i know michigan winters i know um western new york winters but um uh my friends here in the deep south uh, many of them just don't i mean we have we have there's no salt trucks in town you know so for example so when when people say oh there's a snowstorm I don't make fun of it anymore because it's literally dangerous here and everybody so that it's weird because you would think i'd be home and i and you know i'm home and i should be used to it but that was extra devastating in in different ways that i that i didn't expect and um kind of i'm a little embarrassed how much that uh affected me you know that kind of thing but today the sun was shining you know that kind of thing i i made it outside when it was snowing and i i did go sledding um with my family um but uh it's hard i think i, I resonated really I, it resonated really well when you said that you felt like a overstimulated cat i think you know i mean my attention is really has taken a toll and I can feel it because I'm one who can luxuriate within a book or luxuriate over writing a paragraph and not be, you know, um, I could just be lost in my own world. I, I am at this hyper aware alert part. So yeah, anyway, um, I, I want to turn to you questions and those of you who are watching, if you want to type in questions to the chat, I see there's some already ones that are, um, that are coming in, that's great, but I wanna give you some chances to do that. I have one last kind of question for you and then we'll turn it over to kind of um, people in the audience. Um, and Matthew, that is, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the extraordinary um, end notes here of this book, the amount of research you did. Um, again, I am a nerd about those kinds of things and reading the kind of the notes is almost like um, kind of like a, another joy, like almost like a part two, you know, as it is, I mean, the, the, it's, it really, it's almost, I, I can see like a part two emerging just from the notes section and the amount of research. How can you talk about, like, I, I'm also always curious too, um, and I, and I actually don't recall this from the book, if it was mentioned or not, I, I was so involved in the story. Were you literally like, you know, notebook in hand, tape recorder in hand when you had this, like, can you talk about that? But then also how much of it were you rushing to your hotel room to write that day? Or did you just want to kind of gather, 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 and then let that simmer and stew? Like, I'm always curious on how, when, when uh, a book is much more research-based, um, how much of the, you know, interviews and stuff, do you let stew first before you come back to Michigan and begin to write? You know what I mean? Like, can you just talk about, I'm, I'm curious about how even by chapter by chapter, it could be very different depending on, on the background of this. I'm interested in the, you know, what you learned about the physiology of pigeons, all of that. So um, we just have a couple minutes here and I, and I want to turn to the, to the audience, but if you can answer that somewhat shortly that would be great <laughs> well yeah totally um I, I feel like all of those things happen so um i uh if i didn't have my notebook i always have like little scraps of paper like gas station or grocery store receipts yeah. and i would like, scribble down something somebody said you know um on the back of that uh and, um, you know, in, in certain instances, I had to reconstruct conversations to the best of my ability based on sparse notes. Hmm. Uh, other times, I, uh, there were certain folks that did allow me to record interviews with them on my phone. Um, yeah. I still have those unabridged voice memos. Wow, wow. <laughs> um, you archivists out there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, so, um, and then other times I had a more proper notebook. Uh, and then, um, and then there were things when I had nothing and I would just have to remember things impressionistically. Um, and I didn't necessarily quote folks with that, but, um, 
Yeah, and, and then I like tumbled into archives too, like numerous archives and photographed so many documents and, and, and all of that. And so all of that just kind of like ephemera came in there in, in textual form in the notes because I'm, I'm nerdy like that too. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I love it. It's so fascinating. And again, the notes, I don't know, sometimes um, maybe, you know, maybe maybe you're like this too. Maybe I shouldn't um, admit this, but sometimes I get to the notes and I'm like, okay, you know, done. I'm not really discovering anything new. It's like, it's good to see the bibliography. Good job here. I, I mean, I was pouring over the notes just as much as the actual text itself, which is, I can't, I actually can't even remember the last time I did that. So I'm not kidding. I'm not saying that lightly. The notes was so stunningly and meticulously um, uh, laid out and organized for us at the end. So I think the readers are going to be in for a treat, like cover to cover. Um, I mean that quite literally. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I'm going to turn. I see the questions are popping up here. I do, let me see, I wanted to, I have to reach, I think you might have to grab something too, Matthew. Um, yeah. 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 Let's take one second. Five second, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hang on one minute here, I'm, I'm, I'll adjust it here. Okay, <laughs> So this is a little mouse that I found and we've got the mouse and the pigeon there, yay. And, and it's totally unclear what the relationship between mice and pigeons is. Because there's, there's no mice that I can remember in your book, right? Like, unless no, I'm forgetting I, something. No, I, I, I think the, the book is free, of, is mouse free. Yeah. I, just, I just really wanted to, those in the audience, no, I just really, once I knew that Matthew had a mask, he's literally the only person in the country that I know who has a mask from the same manufacturer as my mouse mask. This is an old Halloween costume. I was like, I, we have to wear this. How do we not do this together? What are the odds of us both having the same like manufactured animal, realistic animal mask? Those ears, those ears are everything. I know, you know, Matthew, real quick before, so I'm going to get to the questions. The audience is like, can you please ask my question? Hang on <laughs> one second. I, yeah, yeah, I think I need to, I, I actually do have to take this off because I won't be able to read. <laughs> it's, it's getting super human in this pigeon head, but. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> stand by, stand by. I have to okay. All right. Good. I just didn't know what the condition of my hair was going to be. So, all right. Good, good, good. All right. We're going to start. People are like, please let us get on the questions. All right. The first question, Matthew, here from Bonnie. Um, and I wanted this too, because I was just, and again, maybe, you know, this is the middle of the pandemic. I was just weepy about so many things. Bonnie's asking the casual cruelty towards people and animals, including pigeon, was very upsetting in this book. How did you handle that? You know, especially, you know, again, there was like that, the opening story of, of your own personal loss. Like, how were you just not wanting a sun lamp in your face every day when you were writing this, you know? Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I, it was heart, heartbreaking. Um, I, I, how did I respond? I was heartbroken. Um, and uh, in, in writing the book, um, in order not, not to just, I mean, completely tumble down the rabbit hole of despair, uh, I um, allowed myself to be affected, I guess, um, by um, the, these unexpected beauties that attended um, the, atro the atrocious, uh, mm -hmm. in a way. And it's, it, it's funny, it was like, I, I um, uh, like years ago, I was I was writing this book called The Moral Plots, um, a, a book of poems. This was in 2007. It was like um, I was writing it. I was living in upstate New York when um, when at the drive in volcano, your, ah. your poetry book came out. Mm -hmm. And um, my book was about um, uh, 
1930s murders that took place in Illinois. Like, and, and it was just, it was a long winter and I was writing about murder and it was destroying me. Mm-hmm. And I was just um, thoroughly depressed. Um, Louisa, my, my, my wife was, was telling me I needed something. And, and that something that I needed was at the driving volcano. So every day oh. after reading, mm-hmm. I would go to that book and like uh, just read a couple of poems and, and, uh, and allow these moments of beauty. And so I feel like the collision between things like ode and elegy and wonder and horror, um, celebration and indictment, uh, uh, you know, like awe and heartbreak, um, you know, can, can coexist. And so uh, what helped me through was, was learning certain things about pigeons in a way that served as antidote, like the fact that they can uh, recognize all 26 letters of the English alphabet and other alphabets if so trained. Wow. They, have, they have facial, they recognize our faces. Um, so like if you are kind to a pigeon um, and then leave for a while and then return, it will remember you by your face. It will recognize you as a kind wow. person. Um, yeah, and, and just so, I mean, so things like this. Um, so I feel like the book, um, has these like quiet moments of beauty um, threaded throughout. Oh yeah. But I felt like I need to face, uh, I needed to face the atrocious there too, um, because I, I just feel like as, as we're becoming an increasingly uh, aware uh, culture, it's, it's, it's my hope that um, public opinion eventually will compel De Beers um, to stop being so rapacious when it comes to uh, corporate colonialism and extractive capitalism. So like, I mean, without showing the atrocious, I, um, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to hasten that move toward something better. And I don't know if this book's gonna do, do that. Yeah. But, um, it, it, it felt like something I, I, I needed to face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I absolutely think your book doesn't shy away from that. And I could see how um, you could, you know, and put more emphasis on kind of the happier story and you don't. So I, I hugely appreciated that as well. You know, um, I wanted to see too here in terms of, um, there's another question here, I'm skipping around. How do, you, how do you make sure to do justice to the characters, to the people that you're depicting, that they're fully rendered and as alive on the page as it is in person, you know, um, across culture and even subtle language adjustments, you know? Um, yeah, how did, you, how did you kind of navigate that kind of murky territory? Um, I, I, I just did my best to, I, like, I refused to romanticize um, the people in the piece and to just, like, stay out of the way when, when they were talking, um, both actually when I was speaking to them, and, um, and I did my best to do that on, on the page, too. Um, I mean, I'm very much filtering other things uh, in the book, um, but... Uh, when when folks are are speaking to me, I I you know don't want like the heavy hand of the narrator to come in there and try and contextualize it um, as as you know some sort of uh, you know outsider uh, yeah. too you know and so um, I just wanted to listen uh, and and record um, and uh, essentially um, yeah I mean of of course so, you know I solicited. Um, everybody's permission. Um, folks, I, I, I didn't conceal from anybody in the book that um, I, it was going to be an essay or an article or a book. Um, they knew I was, I was writing something about the things that they were telling me um, because I didn't want to be manipulative in that way either. Mm-hmm. And that comes across, and I really appreciated that as a reader. It didn't feel like icky or weird, you know, like, why is, you know, why is Matthew tricking this 13 year old boy you know it didn't it did it wasn't like that at all it very much felt like um everybody was in on this and um and I think it's a testament to you that it se- it seemed like you know from the villains to the heroes of this of this story um they all kind of wanted to open up to you it seemed like it was very palpable you know that kind of thing so yeah you know um I have another question here from Suzanne 
Um, he says, Matthew, you share with Amy a penchant for deep research and the identification of connections and natural connectivities that build knowledge memorably. Can you share more? Can you share more about how this happens and how do you actually do this research? So I think that's maybe like jumping off a little bit of what, what you discussed earlier, but if you could expand upon that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So like I'm 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 very associative. That's I mean that's the short <laughs> answer. But, um, but I mean maybe um a longer one is so um I I mean my primary genre, you know, back when I started, you know, writing, I guess seriously, uh um, or just writing a lot. I don't know if seriously is the right word, but um, I, 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 I wrote poems. I like it, yep. <laughs> yeah, and so like eventually like I, 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 made, I made the leap to prose, but I just didn't know how to do it. Um, I saw that there was like this major disconnect between like the imaginative alchemy from which I pulled when I was writing a poem versus that from which I pulled when I initially started writing prose. Mm. Um, and so I, I eventually like learned to just like take what I would do in a poem and, and, and bring it to prose. And I guess mm -hmm. like to simplify um, as far as like finding these connections between seemingly dissimilar things, um, as an associative person, I tend to have all of these scraps of information that attend maybe like a primary thread that I'm pursuing yeah. that might seem just totally ancillary or digressive and, and they are. Um, but I feel as if it's it's my job as a, a writer sometimes, um, and I learned this from poetry, um, to labor to uncover the perfect bridge ingredient to connect these seemingly dissimilar bits of, of subject matter. Um, yeah, and, and so like, there's just to find that bridge ingredient, um, which is just kind of electric. And I think um, it, lend, it could lend energy to a work and, uh, you know, just kind of serves as a, 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 a testament to the, the interconnectivity of things, if only, you know, like real and implied, actual and metaphorical, um, associatively, concretely. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. I love that answer because I actually, you didn't know this, but I actually use the, the kind of the metaphor of the bridge too. And I also am an associative writer um, from my poetry and yeah, and I, and my students know this. It's so, so dorky, but maybe you'll appreciate this, Matthew. Do you know in Thor, you've watched Thor, right? Yeah. yeah you know that bridge? I should know that what the name of this, that glittery, um, sparkly bridge. <laughs> to get, to get with, that's what I, do you know what I'm talking about? There's a name for it. Oh gosh, I'll think of it the minute we log off. Anyway, that's what I think of is that connective, that connective bridge, that kind of magical sparkly rainbow. Uh, it's not a rainbow bridge. Maybe that's someone in the, in the chat will know anybody who's a Marvel fan. Um, the, the bridge that connects, um, Thor's home to earth, you know, and things like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, I use that metaphor um, for my own writing as well. So I love it. We're on the same page. Um, Victoria is asking, um, do you see your longer works as sharing qualities or ideas? Maybe you working towards a larger life project like the OV, I, I always purposely mis, mispronounce that word, but um, Matthew Gavin Frank's like life body of work. Are we, is this one step to um, kind of this larger masterwork, your opus, if you will? <laughs> oh. Um, I, I that, that just made me think of another like side effect of the pandemic, um, and maybe it's a good one. Um, so like previously, like when I would like write a book, like when I finished preparing the ghost, uh, you know, I was just like, I mean, hardcore obsessed with the giant squid and this photograph yeah. of the giant squid and the ways in which, you know, um, human beings have uh, 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 characterized and represented animals um, in mythology and religion and literature and art and so on. And so I was just like obsessed with that. Like I couldn't get enough. It was all squid all the time. <laughs> another cat thing, like I got my claws into the subject matter and I just could not retract them. Mm. <laughs> but, but then finally, when I was able to, you know, get free of it, like when the, the book came out, um, it was my habit to just completely squeegee my brain clean wow. of that obsession and move on completely to the next thing. And you could do that. It, it was fun. It was it was easy for you to just say like like windshield wipers like whoop. I'm, I'm yeah, wow. like, like to the point when I had to talk about that book. 
I I didn't remember anything. <laughs> okay. Like I had to research like my own stuff, mm -hmm. like in order to talk about it in in events. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! Because you know, like you know, the lag time with publication, like there was a, a gulf, and I was already like onto something else. But but I can't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, there's the pandemic. Like I just can't like um and like move on to the next thing. Yeah. So I can't I can't let pigeons go right now. I kind of can't let birds go, and so um yeah i i'm not sure like i don't know if i if, if, if i have an opus i mean everything is a milepost uh, or you know sure, in, sure. In, in the artistic life but i don't know if i have if, if i do have an opus maybe it'll be feathery I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well i told you before and i think you thought it was a terrible idea but i could get like the companion piece and i think nobody would be bored if just all bartholomew variations you know like the remix or something like that you know um all right and then one last question matthew and then man need to wrap it up um what are you rose is asking what are you working on now um, and can you name some authors and or books to share with the audience that have been inspirations to you as a writer? That's a nice one to kind of end on. Yeah, totally. So um, I uh, uh, I have to stop writing this book I was working on actually and, and, um, and go back to an even older project. So I, I started working on a book that um, was initially uh, about um, people who build their own submarines or their own submersibles because um, they have this compulsion to sink to depths, um, oftentimes to their own detriment. Yeah. And, oh yeah. my gosh, wait, you have to repeat this again because I just wanna make sure. So there's people that just build their own submarines and yeah. they place them where? In the ocean or in yeah. the lake? Yeah, so like I, I knew this guy, like I lived in Alaska years ago and I actually knew two people there um who were building their own submarines because they needed <laughs> to sink um they just wow. like they just huh. need this and so um and so it began about like the 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 compulsion to sink um it got into issues of you know claustrophobia claustrophilia all of this but yeah. um all of these you know my research kept bumping up against um death and murder mm -hmm. uh and I just couldn't do it. I, and I felt like, okay, if I write this book, I, I keep, you know, bumping up against this. I have to engage it. Mm. I can't now. Yeah. Um, I can't now during the pandemic. Like, I, yeah. I, I just can't do that. Mm. Um, so I've, I've kind of retreated to um, this, this other uh, project that actually uh, has to do with, well, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, I'm just gonna say like a like pigeons feature, but in a a very kind of uh, uh, ancillary way. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good, that's good. I know some people have like kind of a, you know, they don't want to jinx anything with writing anything, and, and but you also have the pigeon mask now, so you know <laughs> it, that might resurface. You might, you know, that might be for the next tour, you know, that kind of thing. Well, Matthew, this is so great. I think we're running out of time here and there's so many amazing questions that we didn't get to yet. Um, you know, maybe could we sneak just one last last part in? Oh, this, this was so this is so good. It's from Stacy. And um, it was just so and I completely agree. You're a true master, Matthew, of telling other people's stories in a way that it feels very honoring and not exploitive to them. Do you ever regret the telling? Is there any part that you, in, in, in your past writing that you regret the telling? Or maybe um, when we tell someone else's story, what, how do you navigate that without saying, hey, here's my manuscript. Can you copy it? You know, can you give me the final thumbs up on it? Because I know that's, that's also hard, you know, um, and, and difficult sometimes to do. Um, so can we end on that just in terms of, because I feel like that's one of those questions and I, if I'm guessing right, I think the answer, um, especially during a pandemic will help us feel less alone and want to kind of connect with people. And I love using your word again, the like bridging, um, two things that are very disparate. How do you make that bridge solid and want to keep doing it? You know, even just hearing your future projects, I know that you're going to be doing, um, Ama amazing work uh, in making these connections, but how do you navigate that personally? And then we'll for sure, for sure end there. All right, all right, yeah. So like, um, 
I, I feel like, yeah, with some of my like early writing, I, I, I do regret um, not talking to people enough or romanticizing um, certain characters, especially like in, in, in early in early nonfiction books. Uh, I feel like I, I, I wrote a book called Barolo way back when, like I wrote it as a graduate student. Um, and it was about uh, working in the wine industry in Italy and everybody just sort of became in that book, I feel looking back on it now, just um, a caricature, um, you know, that was, and you know, they were just kind of tethered to my own romantic notions of Italy in a way that was like maybe more self-serving than serving the characters um, or the, the people um, or the subjects. And so I, I feel like, yeah, now again, like I just try and stay out of the way. And if I'm writing about somebody who isn't alive, um, I've gotten to the point where I want to speak to their descendants mm. um, about the project. So like, for instance, like um, with the giant squid, with the preparing the ghost, um, I wrote about this guy, Moses Harvey, who in 1873 was the first guy to ever take the, the, the who took the first photograph of the giant squid, um, you know, proving its existence. And so um, I, I, I actually sat down with a, a few of Mo Moses Harvey's descendants in Newfoundland and talked to them about the project, talked to them about representation. Um, they were so into it. Um, Joan Ritzy, um, his great, great granddaughter actually runs in archives at Memorial University there. And she's like, oh, come in, check out all of this stuff about him. And, oh my gosh. And, and, and so I feel like, yeah, just like, I mean, sitting down and talking to people and um, we're talking about connection, but I feel like, uh, I mean, I mean, the artifact itself, like the product of, of making something obviously fosters connection between reader and or, or writer and, and, and reader, but the research process really does too in, the, in that way, um, where you really develop relationships with, uh, with your, your, your subjects and with people. Absolutely. That so, yeah. So yeah. Uh. I, I could just go on and on, Matthew. Thank you so much for such. I feel like I'm le I'm learning as well as like fangirling over your over this book, over your writing process, just even how you tackle such really difficult subjects. Um, uh, it's been so great to be able to just um, watch this book, let it fly out into this world, <laughs> pun intended. I don't know if you saw in the chat here, but. Um, uh, <laughs> my husband and a uh, former student who is now your st current student. He, they, they were the two people who knew what we were talking about, the Bifrost. That's oh, the, yeah. the, 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 the bridge, the, the glittery bridge in Thor. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I, maybe Google bridge and Thor on YouTube and you could see how Kenneth Branagh did the special effects on that. <laughs> so, oh. Anyway, well, thank you so, so much, Matthew. It's been such an honor. I um, am just gonna be recommending this to, to my students, to so many people. I can't wait to see um, how the world just ta tackles this um, and really just um, embraces this. This is a one of a kind story. It is. I say I said it on the book and I'll say it again it is unforgettable in the best of ways it made me feel less alone um, during the pandemic I think it's going to be a good companion to anybody so please if you haven't already please pick up his book and um, thank you so so much um, and Gramercy thank you so much it's been such an honor to be here as well Amy thank you so much thank you Gramercy thank you Linda well wow. Linda Hi, you guys. This was wonderful. It was an incredible conversation. And I, I, I mean, your questions, Amy, were very, very thoughtful. And, and Matthew, thank you so much for sharing your remarkable story with us.